Hi, everyone. I'm Tom Boothlay. On behalf of the American College of Cardiology and the Center for Systems Improvement, I'd like to welcome you to the EMS and Systems of Care webinar series, Taking Clinical Quality to the Next Level. Our good friend Tim Phelan is under the weather and won't be able to join us today. This webinar in the series will explore a less commonly used but very useful tool in quality management, the Process Capability Index. If you're watching this webinar live at any time, please feel free to enter any questions or comments you might have by clicking the questions icon at the right side of the browser window. Use the raise hand feature if you'd like to ask questions directly using your webcam and microphone. If you're, if you're selected, you'll appear here on the screen with us and be visible to all participants. If you're watching the archive recording of this webinar, please feel free to email questions and comments to mic, that's M-I-C, at improvethesystem.com. The archive recording will be posted soon after the live session with an email notice and viewing link set out to everyone who registered for the event. Mick will do his best to respond to questions and comments sent in by email regardless of how long it has been after the live event. Presenting today's webinar is my very good friend, Mick Gunderson, president at the Center for Systems Improvement, or as I like to call it, CSI. CSI specializes in elevating the performance of community and regional systems of care for high risk, time sensitive conditions, as well as providing EMS system assessments and quality improvement training services, including the new EMS Quality Academy. The ACC works with the Center for Systems Improvement in development of EMS and systems of care related programs and services. Mick is one of our pioneers in EMS quality improvement. I'm grateful for his friendship and mentorship, and I'm certain that I'm not alone when I say that I appreciate the time and effort that he has put into system design for time sensitive diagnoses. Take it away, Mick. Well, thank you for those kind words, Tom. Just uh, delighted that uh, you're able to to join me on these webinars and help moderate. And uh, Tim, I don't know if you're uh, listening uh, now, but uh, if you are, hopefully uh, you'll recover quickly. Uh, and for those of you who aren't familiar with Tom's work, uh, Tom's a battalion chief for EMS down at uh, Hilton Head Island, South Carolina. Uh, been in EMS a long time, he's been very active, started up the South Carolina Resuscitation Academy, uh, does a lot of work nationally and uh, Coincidentally, today is launching Refresh 2021, which uh, is an amazing project that, that uh, Tom started to try to get uh, research done for his own crews. And, uh, you know, using the, uh, the social media space surrounding uh, medical education, was able to put together just uh, an absolute all-star faculty uh, that are all donating their time. And uh, so uh, I think, uh, how many registrations are you up to now, Tom? As of this morning, right before we launched, we had 7,000 pre-registrations from 91 countries. That's, that's just absolutely awesome. So uh, anyway, check it out at uh, Refresh 2021. Uh, just Google that. Is that the URL, Refresh 2021? 2021.com? It's at, it's at prodigyems.com forward slash refresh 2021. Um, so if you Google just refresh 2021, I put a little more in the Google search and add EMS or EMT refresher, something to help it out. But uh, Or follow the hashtag refresh 2021 on Twitter or Facebook or something like that. Okay. And, and how long is that going to be up, Tom? For all of 2021, uh, it was okay. intended to, you know, research for this recertification cycle. It'll, it'll, it'll give you 30 national hours for the National Registries uh, NCCP program, um, but it's free to any interested human being, really. Um, but, but if you're in it for the refresher hours, they're all CAPSI certified hours. So um, it's there. It's there if you need it. Okay. Well, very good. We're going to go ahead and uh, get the video started. And uh, it's uh, maybe a little under a half hour, and that'll give us plenty of time at the, uh, the end of it uh, before 3 o'clock Eastern uh, to come back and uh, take uh, questions and uh, comments from you live. And uh, just to refresh, uh, on the right side of your screen, 
uh, ask questions with the raise your hand and you'll join us live on the, uh, the video screen uh, or type them into the uh, questions icon, which is also on the right side of the screen down at the bottom. So we're gonna go ahead and uh, fire up the, uh, the presentation. So uh, bear with us for just a moment while that gets started, okay? This EMS and Systems of Care webinar series is brought to you by the American College of Cardiology's National Cardiovascular Data Registry, the NCDR. They provide the chest pain MI registry and its new reporting tool, eReports EMS. This new tool generates STEMI and NSTEMI reports for your specific EMS agency or regional system of care using the data that's already been provided by your receiving hospitals. For details, check it out at acc.org forward slash eReports EMS. You can also access the prior webinars from this series on the resources section of that page. I hope those of you attending this webinar live took advantage of the networking lounge while waiting for the presentation to begin. If not, we will have it open for the 30 minutes following the presentation until about 3.30 p.m. Eastern. This is a pretty interesting resource that's designed to help you meet some of your colleagues that share an interest in EMS time-sensitive systems of care and quality management. You can move freely from table to table to strike up or join conversations, just like in a face-to-face -face reception area. You can also click on the speed networking option to be automatically connected to other attendees for five minutes each. I'd suggest that you quickly introduce yourselves for the first minute each, and then take one more minute each to tell each other about a project or problem you're working on. That'll use up about four of the five minutes. In the remaining minute, you can exchange contact information in the chat window if you'd like, or plan to chat some more in the regular networking area or after the event. So try it out and have some fun with it. And please let me know what you think about these networking features in conjunction with our webinars. Just send me an email at mick at improvethesystem.com. I'd love to get your feedback and any suggestions you may have. So let's get into the meat and potatoes of the presentation and we'll come back live on the other side for your questions and comments. Today we were going to talk about two kinds of tools for measuring process capability and for creating composite measures. But as I got into putting this presentation together and working on the process capability portion, I discovered that it really needed more time to do the topic justice. So I made the decision to focus today's webinar on process capability and the process capability index. We'll talk about composite measures in a future webinar. I'm gonna provide a high level overview on how to calculate process capability and the capability index today and not get too deep into the details of the formulas. Because my goal today is to get you familiar with what process capability and the process capability index metrics are, how to use them and how to interpret them. If these are tools you want to use in your work, there will be some links to references in the notes sections below the video window of the YouTube page where this webinar will be archived within a few days after this live session. Everyone who registered for this webinar will get an email with the link once it has been posted to YouTube. So in EMS, systems of care, other areas of healthcare, and many other areas of business and government in general, we should be measuring the performance of our most important processes. This helps us manage and improve these processes as well as the processes they connect to. And there's truth in the old saying that says what gets measured gets improved. Measuring process performance also lets us report on it so that we can be transparent and accountable. This is especially important in emergency healthcare where patients may have practical limits on making informed market choices when faced with a time-sensitive crisis. Now, when we measure or report on process performance, it will often be compared to a performance standard, requirement, or a goal of some sort. And generically, in process improvement terminology, these are called performance specifications. Looking at one episode of care for a particular patient, the measurement and reporting is pretty straightforward. There's a performance specification and the actual performance on that case. You met the specification or you didn't. But when we're engaging in improvement science, we're usually not focused on the individual case, we're focused on how well our process works overall on most all of our cases. 
We want to know if our process consistently meets the needs of patients or other downstream users or customers of our process who depend on the outputs to meet their performance specifications or clinical needs. So to measure process performance, we'll usually take a batch of data from a given time frame or a series of consecutive cases, or maybe a random sample from that time frame. We'll calculate our performance on those cases and compare it to the performance specifications to see if we're in compliance. Many times the standard goal or customer defined performance specifications are for a certain value or higher or a certain value or lower. That's what we see with EMS response time standards and for things like the ACC AHA guidelines for STEMI care with a first medical contact to device time standard of 90 minutes or less when transporting directly to an emergency PCI capable hospital. This is called a one-tailed specification standard. And there's lots of well-established ways that compliance to a one-tailed standard is measured and reported. So I'm going to talk about the scenario that gets less attention in EMS and emergency care, where the performance specification has two values, an upper and lower value, or to use more specific language, upper and lower specification limits. This is called a two-tailed specification standard. And these are usually used for processes where results are unfavorable, when things are too fast or too slow, too big or too small, too deep or too shallow, too light, too heavy, too much, too little. You get the idea. In an emergency care context, consider clinical process standards or specifications like chest compression rate or depth, ventilation rate or volume or pressure, ET tube insertion depth, and other things of that nature. We can apply two-tailed specification standards to operational processes as well. Consider things like when employees actually clock into work relative to their scheduled start time, or the timing of preventive maintenance on vehicles or other equipment, and we could go on and on. But at a very simple level for external accountability purposes, we could simply report on the percentage of events or items that fell within the upper and lower specification limits and therefore met the standard. But at an operational level, we can tremendously benefit from metrics that give us more detail about how the range and alignment of our process performance compares to the range and position of the specification limits. This makes it possible for us to precisely adjust our process for consistency and alignment to meet the performance specifications. So the metrics used in mainstream industry for this are called process capability and the process capability index. The process capability metric can be used to understand how well our process can fit within the specification limits. The process capability index looks at both fit and alignment to the specification limits. So process capability is the simpler of the two metrics. It's represented by the symbol CP. Process capability is a measure of the ability to fit a process within the performance specifications. To calculate CP on our batch of data, we'll first calculate the mean or average value of our batch. We'll then calculate the standard deviation for that batch. And don't get a rash thinking about standard deviation. It's just a measure of how much variability there is in that batch. We'll then multiply the standard deviation by three and add it to the average. This gives us the calculated upper performance limit. Next, we'll multiply the standard deviation by three again, but this time subtract it from the average to give us the calculated lower performance limit. And the difference between those two, the upper and lower performance limits, is the calculated performance range. But don't get hung up on the math. Just know that this calculated performance range will typically include about 99.7% of the values in a large batch of data. And that allows for any extreme outliers to be disregarded and let the calculated performance range better characterize the range of performance that our process is anticipated to typically operate within. Now, with that calculated performance range, which comes from our batch of actual data, we can compare it to the performance specification range, and that's just the difference between the upper and lower specification limits. Ideally, we want the calculated performance range of our process 
to fit within the process specification limits. And for that to happen, the calculated process performance range needs to be smaller than the performance specification range. And they also need to line up with each other. So this is all probably sounding pretty abstract and some eyes may have already glazed over. So let's try to bring all of these abstract ideas into very clear focus with an emergency healthcare example that we'll all be able to relate to. Let's say that we want to measure the ability of our current process for chest compressions to meet the AHA resuscitation guidelines for compression rates for an adult. Those guidelines state that the acceptable range is 100 to 120 compressions a minute. Those are our upper and lower specification limits. And let's suppose that our current process is fully manual and simply relies upon all of those doing chest compressions to recall their CPR training and to try to guide themselves by listening in their head to the Stayin' Alive song by the Bee Gees. And that has a tempo of about 103 beats per minute, which is within the performance specification range. So to measure the performance of our current process, we'll pull 100 of the last cases with adult CPR and use the resuscitation case review software that's available for our brand of defibrillator to give us the average compression rate for each code that we worked. We'll take those averages for each of the 100 cases and calculate an average of those averages. That gives us an average of 117. It's within the performance specifications of 100 to 120. Great, right? Well, unfortunately, some might stop here thinking that they were doing great, but they would be very misled thinking their process was doing well in meeting specifications. There's more to it. To get a better idea of our true process performance, we need to take some additional steps. We'll calculate a standard deviation. And remember, that's just a measure of how much variation there is in our batch of data. Our standard deviation turned out to be 9.0. We'll multiply it by 3 to get 27. We'll add 27 to our average of 117 to calculate the upper performance limit, and we get 144. We'll then subtract three times the standard deviation, 27, from the average of 117 to get the lower performance limit, and we get 90. The difference between the upper and lower performance limit values of 144 and 90 gives us a calculated performance range of 54. The specification range is the difference between the upper and lower specification limits. For adult CPR, that's the difference between 120 and 100, which is 20. Comparing the performance range of 54 to the specification range of 20, we can see that our current process just isn't capable of fitting inside the specification limits. And we quantify that difference by calculating CP. CP is the ratio between the specification range in the numerator and the calculated performance range in the denominator. A CP or process capability value less than one means that the performance range can't fit inside the specification range. The smaller the CP value below one, the less capable our process is for fitting inside the specification range. Using our calculated performance range and our specification range, we get a CP of 0.37. This CP value of way less than one tells us that we need to dramatically improve the consistency of our chest compression rate process. There's way too much variation in our actual performance. So an ad hoc improvement project team is chartered to try to fix this problem. And we talked about ad hoc improvement project teams in one of our previous webinars. Or maybe it's just the medical director, training manager, and the QA manager getting together to work on this. But Regardless of who's doing the work, they need to come up with some ideas called improvement hypotheses on how we might try to improve the consistency of the chest compression rate process. In this example, the ad hoc improvement project team comes up with several ideas. Train everybody again on basic CPR. Maybe write a disciplinary memo on any crews that failed to perform within the specification limits. Maybe do a post-call review with crews before the end of their shift with an emphasis on feedback for their compression rate performance 
versus the performance specifications on the rate from the AHA guidelines. Maybe we could get a metronome app on the crew's smartphones that will sound out 110 beats per minute in cadence so they can listen and adjust to it accordingly. Or maybe just get mechanical CPR devices. So in this scenario, the team chose to start with post-case reviews since that did not require purchasing new gear for the crews. They figured out a way to quickly analyze the CPR data from the defibrillators with case review software and then train the crews and field supervisors on how to debrief with the CPR performance reports generated by the case review software. So a while after making this change, they measured their chest compression process performance again. Their CP went up from 0.37 to 0.65, a definite improvement, but not as much as they'd like to have. They also noticed that the average shifted. It's now faster at 128 compressions a minute. The standard deviation is smaller though at 5.1, so that's a big improvement as well. So the process is now more consistent, but the average rate is 128 and the center of the specification range is 110. The performance average is quite a bit off from the center of the specification range. This shows us that looking at CP is not enough. CP compares the range of actual performance to the range of the specifications. CP does not say anything about how well the two are aligned. It turns out that there is a quality metric for this issue. It makes an adjustment to the CP value to take process centering into account. And it's called the Process Capability Index and it's represented by the symbol CPK. Again, I'm not going to go into the details of its calculation here. Look for the references on the YouTube page where this webinar will be archived. Calculating CPK for the process, they get 0.52, still below 1. They have more work to do on consistency and process centering. A key takeaway point here, though, is that the process capability metric, CP, is okay to use when the performance range is pretty much centered on the specification range. But when it's not centered, CPK should be used. And CPK is okay to be used even when things are centered. So that means that CPK is more flexible in when it's used. And that's why it's recommended to be your go-to metric for measuring and reporting process performance against a two-tailed specification in a more precise manner to guide your improvement efforts. Again, I'll put references for these calculations into the notes below the video window of the YouTube page where this webinar will be archived. So continuing the story of the ad hoc improvement project team for chest compression rate, they decided to make another change to the process to improve consistency and hopefully improve process centering as well. They added the metronome app to the smartphones carried by their crews. The app was set to sound out a cadence of 110 beats per minute, the same as the center of the specification range of 100 and 120 compressions per minute from the AHA. After a while, they pulled another 100 cases, all from after the point where the metronome was added to their process design. The new performance average for the compression rate was 112, much, much closer to the target of 110 than the previous process average of 128. The standard deviation got better too. It's now only 2.9. Remember that it started out at 9 and later came down to 5.1. The new upper performance limit was 120.7 and the new lower performance limit was 103.3, .3, giving them a calculated performance range of 17.4. That's finally less than the specification standard of 20. Great news. As we would expect, the CP was finally greater than 1. It's now 1.14. But alignment remains an issue. Calculating the CPK, we see it's only 0.91, and we need to get it above 1. So the ad hoc improvement project team did some debriefings with crews to get their feedback on the process design. Some of the ad hoc improvement project team members were frontline EMTs, so they had some feedback to the team as well. And the feedback brought up an issue with the metronomes. By default, the metronome app volume level is set to the middle of the volume range for the smartphone speaker. 
It was not uncommon for the person doing chest compressions to have difficulty hearing the sound of the metronome. Some crews turned up the sound on their own. Some left it as it was. And the checklist being used by the crews for managing the resuscitation scene did not have a step for increasing the volume of the smartphone to maximum when the app was started. So it was all left to chance. So they made another change to the chest compression process design to include turning up the smartphone speaker volume to maximum and made sure that it was added to the checklist. After a while, they pulled another 100 cases, all from after the point when the process change was implemented, this time for the speaker volume increase and adding that onto the checklist. The new performance average for the compression rate was 111.2, even closer than before to the target of 110. The standard deviation also improved. Recall that it started out at 9.0, came down to 5.1, then to 2.9 and is now at 1.8. The newest upper performance limit was 116.6 and the newest lower performance limit was 105.3, giving them a calculated performance range of only 10.8. And that's way less than the specification range of 20. Wonderful news. So as we would expect, the CP got even better. It's now 1.85 and the alignment issue is fixed too. The new CPK is 1.63. We really needed to get it above 1. So 1.63 really knocked it out of the ballpark. So while this case is theoretical, it is entirely feasible for a real EMS provider organization or hospital code team or emergency department to do this. And as for the calculations, you can do them with a pencil and paper if you have the math skills or use a handheld calculator. But the easiest way is using some quality management oriented statistical software programs. They will have CP and CPK functionality built in. There's also Microsoft Excel plugin software packages for quality management that'll have that functionality as well. But when you use those software tools to make the calculations, it's imperative that you know what they mean, when to use them, and how to interpret the results. So that's it for process capability and process capability index metrics. Let's go back into live mode for your questions and comments. Mick, All right. That's, uh, that's interesting. In particular, um, my department's done a lot of work with high-performance CPR and rate depth recoil and CPR for action time and things like that. So. I recognize a lot of the things that we did without understanding these basic mathematical concepts. We, you know, we made a lot of the same struggles about implementing the metronome. I never really um, thought about the volume of the metronome being a problem, but we definitely used the post event review software to understand where we were because in the old days before, you know, I think it was probably what 2000 AHH just basically said, push hard and push fast at least a hundred times a minute. And my gosh, did my staff get the memo. I think our elite performers were compressing about 170 times a minute. Um, they had their own adrenaline going. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we really had to throttle them back and reteach them how to do compressions much slower. Um, and But there's nothing better than a metronome as far as correcting the rate. You still have to worry about recoil, of course. and and perishock pauses and everything else. But uh, I personally thought that was a, an excellent example. Um, another thing, you know, that we've been looking at lately is the AHA's uh, telecommunicator CPR performance metrics, like how many seconds into the call until we recognize sudden cardiac arrest and how many seconds into the call before compressions are going on the other end of the telephone. So. Um, I could tell you said it tongue in cheek, but the part about like uh, sending out a memo threatening discipline if they didn't compress it the right uh, is, is, is not how we achieve quality with a whip, you know. Uh, so anyway, in, uh, kudos for that. I found that uh, very interesting. Could you give us some other examples uh, other than, um, well, let's start with TCPR. How would you, where do you draw the line between turning it do you ever worry that by making it so mathematical 
that it's dehumanizing in any way? <laughs> like, like, tell me how you walk that balance between respecting your employees and treating them like not not machines. No, no, a, a very valid point, Tom. And and the math goes all goes on behind the scenes. And the objective, I as I see it, for the math is to give as accurate of a picture of the performance as possible. Uh, so it's like you're standing in front of a mirror. You, you don't want Vaseline smeared all over it, obscuring the view of the data. You want it to be as, as clear as possible. And that's why I brought up the point about where that average, um, if you looked at it all by itself, uh, could be misleading. Yes, the center of that performance range was within the AHA guidelines, but there was so much variability in the first batch of data uh, that most of the stuff was all outside the specification limits. And so that's why I really wanted to emphasize, you know, using this in these scenarios with a two-tailed specification. Uh, you know, the, the ones with one tail where a certain value are higher, a certain value are lower, that's a little bit more straightforward, but the issue of centering the process uh, within the performance specification range and then how wide it is uh, both come into play. And the other kind of classic way of describing this uh, metric is uh, using the analogy of trying to park a, a car into a garage. So the garage, the edges of the garage door is the upper and lower specification limits. And the width of the car is the performance range. So if you have a real wide car relative to the opening of the garage door, it can't fit in the garage. If the car is narrower, uh, it can fit. That would be a CP of over one. But if the garage door is here and the car is over there, it still isn't going to fit. So you have to have width and alignment put in just the right way in order to have a process that's capable of meeting your performance specifications. So that's the, 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 the typical way that it's described. But uh, when I do these, I like to use uh, an EMS example. So, you know, whether it's chest compressions or ventilation volume, uh, and, you know, we're starting to see some technology now for measuring ventilation volume, uh, ventilation pressure, uh, Ventilation rate, obviously, would benefit tremendously from a, a metronome. Uh, ET tube insertion depth, those are some of the examples I threw out there. But, uh, you know, as you start thinking about what are examples, uh, you know, in my organization about issues where too fast or too slow, too big, too small, whatever the case may be, I want you to start thinking about the two-tailed specification and using that perhaps as uh, CPK as the way in which you report the performance. And then you've got good, accurate feedback to your crews, uh, you know, on how well your process is working. Mm -hmm. is, is there any, and the answer is probably no, because I'm not, I don't, um, if, if I definitely was going to talk about statistics, I'd be the one with the four dummies book, like in his hand, because, um, I, I kind of intuitively understand what you mean by standard deviation. Um, you want you don't want your outlier skewing the data, if I understand that correctly. You mentioned outliers, but as a EMS manager or chief or training captain, anything, how do you approach outliers? I get it. We don't want it to be mucking up the data, but but you're interested in outliers, right? You want to know why they're so far out of the range. Tell me more about that, because like, let's say I was the CEO of a hospital. And somebody came to me and said, well, our average wait this month was two hours in the waiting room before somebody got to see a doctor. I'd also want to know, well, what was the range and what were the outliers? Tell me about who waited five hours and tell me what was going on and why that happened. So tell me how outliers can nourish this conversation as well. Sure. So what happens in the case of an outlier is you initially come to the uh, conclusion or hypothesis or suspicion, if you will, uh, that there was something weird going on in that particular case. And, you know, you do a, a root cause analysis, which can be as simple as talking to the people involved on that particular 
uh, incident, you know, what was going on? And uh, I'm actually going to use a, a, another EMS example. And this is a real one from back in the days when I worked down in Pinellas County, Florida. Uh, you'll recall that uh, back in the 90s, uh, the AHA recommendations then were to defibrillate as quickly as possible uh, if you were presented with a shockable rhythm. And so we made a, a big QI push about uh, trying to figure out how to report uh, the uh, at patient and first shock time interval. And so what we did is we put a, a protocol in place with the comm center uh, that said whenever crews arrived uh, initially and actually made patient contact, not on scene, but eyes on patient, uh, in violation of normal radio etiquette, they would just key their microphone and say, you know, rescue one at patient, okay? And if the dispatcher could, uh, they would timestamp that, and we put that into a, uh, a shortcut key on their keyboard. So if they had that call up and you, you say you're doing the dispatcher doing the case following on that particular case, you'd hit F6 or whatever it was, and it would timestamp that into the notes. And if it was a patient that presented with cardiac arrest in a shockable rhythm, uh, the other thing you would do, just like you did with the at patient uh, transmission, is first shock. And so you'd say, you know, rescue one, first shock. You would timestamp it. And, and we know they were dialing the energy with their thumb on the pedal too, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, there there was some gaming going on. That that might that might be a different story. But oh, that wasn't gaming. That's just how the old ones, you know, back in the day when you actually used defibrillator paddles. I'm I'm sure uh, I'm sure you remember. <laughs> oh yes, oh yes. So um, so we would get these data points, and we were finding that there was minutes and minutes on a lot of cases going by between the at patient and first shock interval on cases presenting with VF or, or pulseless VTAC, and we're just kind of scratching our heads, you know, what's, what's going on? And what we discovered, at least in our system, was something that just kind of got into the culture was uh, that people didn't like to work the code uh, where they found the patient necessarily. They would move them to a, a more accessible location, which I get, but for the purposes of giving that initial shock, even though they might be you know, in an inconvenient spot, if you can get access uh, and, and get that shock in quickly, even if they're still on the bed, you don't wanna work the code on the bed because of the, the mattress, right? but you could get that first shock in. And so once we discovered that people were moving furniture and moving the patient around and doing all these other things before delivering the first shock, that's when we found out what was causing all of these extreme outliers of several minutes. So simply explaining the situation, uh, you know, after we did the, the debriefings of the crews, uh, you know, again, in a non-threatening manner, you know, tell us about what happened on the call. Walk us through step by step how the call evolved. And then we would hear these stories about moving patients before the initial defibrillation shock. And so it was the, the, irony, feedback. the yeah. irony in 2020, we would want them to move the patient first. <laughs> So, you know. yeah, so, uh, but the science evolves, doesn't it? We, we yeah. used to do, I used to ventilate the heck out of patients and I don't know right. how many I killed, you know, just as a result of overzealous ventilation, but we didn't know. Well, so it, it goes to show you have to, in some respects, be careful what you measure um, because you want to make sure you're focusing on the right thing. That's, that seems like a, a wise point to me. We've got a couple questions here. One is from Sean Christopher, who is asking, after we make a change, particularly with cardiac arrest, it seems to take quite a bit of time to get a good number of encounters to actually perform valid statistics. What are some recommendations to overcome this hurdle of small numbers? Yeah, that, that's the, the, <laughs> the challenge of, of a small N is, is, is very uh, valid. Uh, so thanks for bringing that up. What I generally recommend people do when they have a smaller case volume is instead of, you know, rotely measuring once a month or, you know, once a week, whatever time interval that people typically do, it seems like the default is to measure things once a month. 
you might ha not have enough cases. So reporting on what the average or standard deviation or CP, CPK, whatever the metric is, on that small number of cases, I don't think is particularly useful because of that small number issue. And so what I recommend in those situations is to use a consecutive case series. So take a minimum of say 20, 25 cases. Above that level, the statistics start to make a little bit more sense. So you take your last 25 cases and you calculate it. And if that was a month and a half, great. If it was two months, fine. If it was three months, whatever it is, until you reach that 25, you don't recalculate, uh, you don't calculate the number initially. And then as you move forward, there's a couple things you could do. You could, on your 26th case, recalculate the last 25 and the, the, the oldest one drops off, okay? So you just have this moving range where you continuously recalculate with your most recent 25 cases, or you wait until you have the next 25 before you update the metric. So there's a couple things like that that even a low volume system can use to update the data. It's just a little frustrating that you might not have a new data point uh, as often as uh, the big metro agencies, but that's you know just a, a way of dealing appropriately uh, with low case volumes in calculating performance statistics. Yep, definitely. I know it is at least reassuring. It might It's not statistically valid, but if you identify a problem um, in your system and you roll out training for everybody to say, well, here's the problem we've identified. Here's what we would like you to do. Explain why and then show them how to do it. It is re it's reaffirming, it's reassuring to see the first couple ones that happen going in the right direction. It might not be statistically valid, but it's always a little bit, it's a little disheartening if the first uh, few seem off kilter while you're waiting to see that correction being made. So I can certainly appreciate that. We, we do about 50 uh, cardiac arrests a year. We, a lot more than that during COVID apparently, but um, you know, it's been, a, it's been a rough year for cardiac arrest survival on Hilton Head Island, honestly. Well, to, to your example, though, uh, Tom, uh, I, I would like to interject that in that scenario, I'm not saying that you shouldn't be measuring and looking at the performance until you have the next 25 cases. What I would encourage you to do is have a run chart and mm -hmm. say you're looking at at patient to first shock time, for example, and you have, you know, just different, you know, data points going along. And you might not come to the conclusion that you have a new trend until you have eight consecutive data points in a row all pointed the same direction. These are called run chart rules. Uh, and uh, that, that's, again, pretty standard uh, quality management statistics. Uh, there's different rules for when you can decide that there is a statistically significant signal in the data to suggest your performance has changed. And what'll often happen is when you introduce an, a change, so you're gonna be going, you know, your data has just kind of got its normal range of variation. It's kind of wobbling around. And uh, there's something called a statistical process control chart. And it puts, you know, boundaries above and below this. This is the normal range of variation we normally see. And then when that data starts creeping up out of that range, uh, that's one of those signals that something is starting to change. And if you intentionally change the process with training, a new technique, et cetera, you're trying to provoke that unusual process behavior. And right after you start the change, you get a lot of variation as people start getting used to the new process. And then, okay, this is how we do it. And then it'll stabilize and go into a new range of typical performance. So I would encourage people when they're doing those sorts of measures uh, to track their data, every case longitudinally and familiarize yourself with a run chart and a statistical process control chart. Uh, and that will tell you when you now have a statistically significant signal in your data and you can confidently say, yes, there is something going on here and it's not just a random fluke. That makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense to me, definitely. Uh, there's another question here. Um, Don Shelza is asking, when working on improvements, do you find it better to first work on consistency, reducing standard deviation, 
um, increasing CP or centering uh, increasing CPK? Uh, I, I recommend you work on consistency first. And uh, for those of you who uh, you know, do archery or shooting, uh, think of it like a shot group. So when you're trying to uh, you know, improve your accuracy with your bow and arrow or your, uh, your firearm, you want a nice tight shot group. And that's a matter of you know, holding you know, your, your weapon steady and having a smooth release of your string or a nice smooth squeeze of the trigger so that you're very consistent, you get a tight shot group. And then you adjust your sights. Once you've got consistency, then you can adjust the sights, you know, to get it centered right onto the target, okay? Uh, so work on consistency first, making sure that everyone is following the process as precisely as possible so that when you then introduce a process change, everyone keeps doing it consistently and now you start moving that process over, up, down, whatever the case may be, uh, to center it right on the target. Mm -hmm. um, a follow-up question or comments from Sean about outliers versus, you know, taking into consideration standard of deviation, when to include, when to exclude the data. Is there a good rule of thumb for that? Or, um, you know, it, it, how do you account for the outliers, I guess? is is embedded in that question yeah so um if, if i understand the question correctly uh the, you should have strict inclusion and exclusion criteria for example let's suppose we're measuring uh at patient to first shock intervals again just to use that uh example since we introduced it before uh you might exclude cases where uh uh, there's uh, unusual circumstances at the scene, uh, like maybe the patient's still in the water. It's a drowning, okay? So that's a very different process scenario than, you know, laying in the middle of a living room at a single family residence. Uh, so, you know, you need to try to take out those cases that have special circumstances uh, so that you're really measuring a homogenous a relatively homogeneous group of cases uh, where you would expect the performance uh, to proceed in a, in a normal fashion. Uh, well, that's, that's a good point, Mick. I mean, I think you there is always going to be that judgment there. In that scenario, yes, remove it because it didn't really fit. The person was floating in the middle of a pond versus um, a paramedic that didn't recognize VFib for 10 right. minutes. Correct. Two completely different scenarios. One is just the way it happened. The other is actually something that needs to be addressed. Yeah. But you wouldn't necessarily want to muck up all your data because of that one event, but you, but it still needs to be. So there's always it always takes a human being deciding how to apply the results or or what is a fair representation when we're especially if we're publicly reporting it to our city council or something like that. Yeah, and that's why it's it's fair to come up with those inclusion and exclusion criteria ahead of time, not make up new ones after, uh, after the fact. Now you can revise them periodically. Uh, so let's suppose you didn't think of this very valid situation uh, originally, then you change your inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, and then, you know, perhaps uh, just stated in your reporting that at this point, we change the inclusion and exclusion criteria uh, just to be transparent about it, and now we move forward. And you see a, a lot of this sort of stuff working sometimes helpfully and sometimes I think not so helpfully uh, in exclusions and exclusions for things like first medical contact to device time in, uh, in STEMI care. Uh, a lot of people think that there's too many exclusions uh, in there. Uh, and it kind of brings up you know, two ways to report it. One is all comers, what is our number? regardless of any unusual circumstances. Uh, and that kind of lets you know what the reality of what's happening in your community is. And then another number that says, and here's the ones that have this, you know, fairly homogenous representation of the process. And I think it's helpful to have both. Uh, much like the thing we see with uh, uh, patients getting, uh, you know, delayed in, uh, 
uh, getting a PCI because they were in cardiac arrest. And sometimes the cardiologist doesn't like to take them to the cath lab because it makes their numbers look bad. So the recommendation is that let's report all comers and then let's also report uh, the, the ones that uh, had their case complicated by cardiac arrest prior to getting to the cath lab and look at, at both sets of numbers. Well, good point, because if you're not in a double blind placebo controlled something, there's always this unconscious bias that can potentially creep in. One example that I like to cite, because being somebody that used to, before I was promoted to EMS chief, used to be a person that entered all the CARES data, there would be, there was a situation where we had an unequivocal, unwitnessed VF arrest, and the patient survived the hospital discharge with good neural capacity. Well, I want a credit for that, but it was unwitnessed and it wouldn't go into our Utstein survival bucket and it killed me to call it unwitnessed because I wanted to, you know, <laughs> celebrate it. And so I'm like, I never even thought of that before. So yeah. it makes me realize that even somebody reporting data can have certain desires or biases. And then so I pulled all the national cares data and like some kind of astounding, like a third of all shockable cardiac arrests are categorized as unwitnessed. And I'm like, God, that doesn't really match my experience in the decade that we've been reporting to CARES. We have very, almost all of our shockables are witnessed, our bystander witness. That just, so that's just a, you know, it's, it, it could be, but it's different than our experience. And so, yeah. it, 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 so internally I start to say, well, let's start tracking, not just every witnessed shockable cardiac arrest. Let's, Let's do a run chart, as you say, and track that against all shockables, regardless if it was witnessed or unwitnessed, to see what happens with those two figures kind of running parallel, just to keep ourselves honest, to make sure that we're never unconsciously gaming the data, you know? So Yeah, yeah and, and, and that's uh, something you need to uh, kind of uh, intellectually, you know, insulate yourself from, is think through how could this consciously or unconsciously be gained. I, I've always worried about uh, people when they're coding cases, coding as in the data entry, not working the code, but uh, uh, entering their data that all non-survivors were non-cardiac etiology, you know, and other, you know, misadventures like that. Uh, the other one that's kind of an uncontrolled variable that's always bothered me is, uh, it seems to be a factor of organizational culture about which cases a given agency chooses to attempt resuscitation on. Uh, some places I visited, if uh, you know, it, it's it's a nursing home or was unwitnessed, and you know the the wind velocity is more than three miles an hour, uh, they don't work the code. They don't work anything but you know the the freshest presentations. So that biases their survival numbers. And you know, <laughs> so I, I'm just saying that there's other ways that, you know, the data can get a little weird. And sure. so, you know, in spite of the statistics, uh, you have to look at the quality of the data and the way the data is gathered as well. Sure. Uh, but at least in the calculations, let's make sure that we're not mucking that up, uh, you know, with reporting an average. But no idea how much variation there is behind it. Yeah, I mean, is that sort of like, that sort of, that reminds me of average response time versus 90th percentile. We want to, yeah. you know, we, we don't want a figure that looks good, but has a, a much broader range than we would otherwise be comfortable with. I got a question for you. How about this? Like you gave the example, very easy when the AHA says it should be 100 to 120, or says telecommunicator CPR, we should recognize the event within 60 seconds, we should have hands on the chest, you know, 90 seconds, 120 seconds at the most when someone gives us the performance benchmark. But for a system that's kind of blazing its own path and improving things that really, not that they've never been improved before, but they've never been targeted for improvement in a very specific way before. I'll give you an example. Um, let's say you're a system that uses mechanical CPR. And in a classroom, you're able to apply that device in 10 seconds on a mannequin. But when you do post-event review, you're like, yeah, our application time on actual people um, is really variable. 
and some of them are going up to 60 seconds or more. How do you know what time limit should be your target? How do you decide what those parameters are gonna be in the first place? Um, two, a couple parts of the question. I, I, I did wanna say very quickly, uh, I noticed in the, the notes that uh, Don left out, which thing should you adjust first? Uh, the, the consistency or the, the targeting? Uh, and my answer, Don, is consistency. Work on consistency first. Get your tight shot group and then adjust your rifle sights uh, to line it up with the specification range. So, so for for your uh, item, uh, Tom, the kind of lost my train of thought there for a moment. I'm sorry. Well, that's okay. Uh, we were talking about mechanical CPR and application time and me wondering, do you just invent a target? Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So the way I would start is see where I am now. What is my current range of performance? So calculate your performance range, right? Get the average, calculate the standard deviation, multiply it by three, blah, 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 blah. And you get, here's where we are now. If with, with a two-tailed standard or, you know, this is where I am on, on a one-tailed standard, you know, plus or minus however much you've got for standard deviation. So now you have an idea about the spread and where the center of that distribution curve is, right? And in any scenario, you always want to do better tomorrow than you did yesterday. So you're just going to start out with trying to make it a little bit better every day. And then if you have an idea for a whole new way to do the process, you know, a, a new process design, uh, then you introduce that. And instead of comparing yourself against an externally developed standard, you're trying to better your performance against your historical uh, performance. So on our chart, you know, we're going along like this and we made a change. Did it provoke a positive change? Maybe it even provoked an untoward change. But if you're not graphing it out, that won't be readily apparent to you. So that's where I start is I say, let's start and say that we don't want to get worse than we are today so that's our standard is our that's historical cool. control Pardon? <laughs> very nice goal yeah yeah our goal is not to get worse okay <laughs> and then we start making our process more consistent and if it's a two-tailed standard we try to center it uh if it's a one-tailed standard we just try to elevate it and it can be just that easy now if you do have science that shows that past 90 minutes, there's this cliff in survival rate or past four minutes in cardiac arrest, then you've got science saying, somehow we gotta come up with a process to get us you know, intervening before the four minutes. So if you have some science to guide it, great. In the absence of science, just use your historical control. Makes perfect sense, makes perfect sense. Uh, Mick, we're coming up on three o'clock here. So, uh, and I think um, that, that's all the questions. Did you wanna start wrapping up? Yeah, so uh, again, I wanna reiterate to everybody, thank you for coming. Uh, I would encourage you to go to the networking lounge after we uh, the end of the session. It'll be open for the 30 minutes uh, afterwards until 3.30 Eastern. Uh, and, you know, don't be a wallflower. Jump in, join a table. Uh, there's going to be the natural phenomenon, and nobody wants to sit at a table by themselves, so somebody's going to need to be the first to come sit down at the table. And I don't know if you noticed this, but the software will automatically add more chairs to every table up to a maximum of eight. Uh, so I noticed in the, uh, the session uh, before we started uh, that there was one table had eight people on, and then there was all kinds of people kind of uh, in the hallway, so to speak, uh, that didn't come jump on a table. I know there were some issues with uh, web browser problems. Uh, again, Google uh, Chrome is optimized uh, on this particular platform. Uh, so if you are running into some issues, uh, next time try to use uh, Google Chrome. Uh, but uh, I think there's a, a lot of value to be gained of uh, talking to the other people who are you know, sufficiently interested in this topic to listen to something as uh, perhaps obscure as performance uh, specification indexes on two-tailed distribution standards. 
Uh, so <laughs> for me anyway, it's, uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to meet people uh, of kindred spirits, uh, whether it's about EMS in general, systems of care for time sensitive emergencies uh, or quality management. So please take advantage of that opportunity. I think as we get more people in there, uh, then some people start opting for the speed networking, which uh, I think will also be kind of interesting uh, once we've kind of got a critical mass of people in there. Uh, click on the speed networking thing and it will automatically, with other people that have opted in, give you five minutes and, you know, you just meet a bunch of people. It, uh, it's a good thing. So uh, I hope everybody uh, tries to take advantage of it. And again, I, I'm really looking forward to your feedback on whether or not uh, this is a uh, uh, a hit or a dud uh, in terms of added functionality for these webinars. And um, if anyone would like more information about eReports EMS reporting service for acute myocardial infarction, you can fit, you can visit acc.org forward slash eReports EMS for updates um, and to view prior webinars from the series. The webinars can also be found at the new EMS Quality Academy from CSI at emsqualityacademy.com. Thanks everybody for joining. And on behalf of the American College of Cardiology and the Center for Systems Improvement, appreciate you being here. Uh, look forward to getting that uh, email from us in the, the next few days uh, for the archive version of this recording. And again, uh, on that YouTube page where it's archived, uh, I'll have some references to these formulas or feel free in the meantime, just Google process capability metric or process capability index uh, and uh, on YouTube or, you know, search engine of your choice. And there's plenty of stuff out there on it. Thank you so much. And I'll see you in the networking lounge.